Let's get straight to the point. Stevens Point has one of Wisconsin's most historic breweries. Let's check out where my favorite line of ciders are created. Visiting Stevens Point, you'll soon realize the city loves their historic brewery. I love how it's still very small and local. We've been able to stay here since 1857. The city of Stevens Point was actually started a year after in 1858. So it's kind of nice that we have a lot of history that we've been able to keep and kind of maintain throughout the years while still expanding with all our different product lines. Every customer can find something that they like here. Um, whether it's a hard cider, a beer, or a soda, we kind of have a nice variety for people. And it's really close to the community too. Everyone kind of knows Point Beer, they know the history behind it. We do a lot of giving back to the community. A recently added beer garden gives the community another great gathering spot. That was a new addition and we just had our first full summer season was last year. This is our kind of second take at it. It's all outdoors where we have a trailer out there that houses 12 different options on draft and it's a mix of our point beers, we got root beer on draft, whole hog and our hard ciders, but then we also have a refrigerated section out there that has bottles and cans of everything that might not come in kegs or just isn't on draft at that moment. We do like to do a lot of pilot brews out there, meaning when our brewmaster Mike is thinking of something and experimenting, he'll put it just in kegs for us to test out and get feedback from customers first. You may have noticed the unique tappers. Point's mascot has been used since the 80s. He was actually taken from a picture we found in the archives. Everyone in the picture was able to be identified by family members and friends except for one guy. He never knew his name, what he did here, could have been a brewmaster, we're not sure. Could have been a guy just off the street that came in and was like, hey, I'll have a beer, sounds great. Not sure there, but we decided to adopt him into the Point family, named him Nicholas C. Point. Nicholas C. is one of the current owner's son's names, along with Point is in reference to Stevens Point, along with that cone head. See it on draft, you know what it is right away. It's a point, yet a point. Another fun thing to do at the brewery is to take the tour. We try to offer tours every single day that we're open. Days we might have a little bit less of options of like the times, just because we're working around the production area, but we do offer a lot of tours on our weekends when it's a little busier. We met John, who was able to give us a tour focused on history. I'm John Harry. I'm the executive director of the Portage County Historical Society, and uh, we operate four historic sites around uh, Portage County, but then we also do historic brewery tours here in the brewery, too. John emphasized the ties to the community. I mean, this brewery is the community. There's such a tie between the brewery and Stevens Point as a whole because the brewery was founded in 1857. Stevens Point incorporated as a city in 1858. There has been no Stevens Point without Point Brewery. Um, and over the years, there have been chances for Point Brewery to maybe do more or even make more money, but at the expense of the local community that's been so loyal to them, and they've chosen not to. Good example of this is in 1973, something that basically saved Point Brewery. As all these breweries were going out of business across the United States, a lot of small town breweries in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, like Point Brewery, were just going out of business. Uh, big beer was taking over. And there was a newspaper columnist in Chicago named Mike Royko, who was a writer for the Chicago Daily News. And he wrote an article that said, American beer tastes as if it had been passed through a horse first. And he wasn't wrong at that point because big beer had taken over and so all these big breweries, every product tasted the same, there was no variety, craft beer really wasn't a thing yet. People freaked out and said, how dare you insult my, my Budweiser and my Schlitz? And so he said, fine, I'll put it to a test. So he had the first modern taste test in 1973 and what the results were, he, he, he used beers, anything he could find. And uh, the results of that contest were the number one beer in the world was a beer from Germany, which makes sense. But the number, one, number two beer in the world and the number one American beer was Point Special. Suddenly you had calls from all over the country for Point Special. TWA Airlines wanted to uh, have 200 cases a week 
on their on their planes. Um, distributors from as far away as Montana wanted to sell Point Special. Everybody read about this. That is this big thing because this guy was nationally syndicated. And the brewery was not ready for that. Like their equipment was not in that, you know, it, it was in good shape, but it wasn't, you know, ready to produce a lot more beer. And so the uh, management of the brewery at that time said, no, if you want point, you have to come to Stevens Point. So they came up with the slogan, if you're out of point, you're out of town. Let's go back to the point when the city began. In the early days of Stevens Point, it was a it was a logging town, and what you uh, had then was a lot of very thirsty lumberjack men, um, and later their families too. Um, but you had a lot of immigrants, and what the immigrants brought over from places like Germany and Poland was a beer drinking culture, and so you needed to have a brewery to be able to service those people. And in the 1850s, 1860s. Transporting beer was not something that you would really do a lot because you had to keep beer cold because it wasn't pasteurized. And so it was really important that there were local and regional breweries for these different settlements in northern Wisconsin to be able to uh, provide fresh, tasty beer to the citizens uh, of those areas. I should note that Point Brewery is a survivor. Most small towns in Wisconsin had a brewery at one point or another and uh, we just happen to still have ours through a lot of combinations of different factors um, but we're really lucky to still have a point brewery here as a lot of places don't have theirs anymore. This brewery was founded in 1857 but it's not like it just came out of nowhere in 1857. Stevens Point was a logging hub, people uh, driving logs down the river and it was a stopping off point. Uh, George Stevens was a guy who had a storehouse here in 1839 and into the early 1840s and so that's how it became known as Stevens Point and the city just continued to grow as this became a popular stopping point for the logging industry. This road that's right outside the brewery here um, was known as Plank Road and there are a lot of plank roads. It basically meant that there were wood planks instead of just dirt on the road. So um, this was the main thoroughfare into Stevens Point. What stood on this land was a hotel called the Plank Road House. And that stood where the gift shop area is today. Um, and so that was a hotel um, and a tavern. And there was a German immigrant named George Ruder who lived near uh, Nuremberg in Germany, was not the heir to his family's brewing fortunes. They were a brewing family. And he decided that he was gonna come to America, worked in Milwaukee for a few years at Oberman Brewing Company, and then saw an advertisement in a newspaper that said we need certain services up here in Stevens Point and they would take ads out because these were growing frontier communities uh, they would take ads out for things like school teachers clergy uh, doctors and beer brewers you gotta have beer um, and so he thought well that's, that seems like a good idea so he comes north up to Stevens Point which was a small little logging town on the river and he passes this point on his way into town and this uh, tavern and, and hotel they were starting to build a brewery because they had thought of this and so this is 1856 and so George Ruder buys the whole complex from them and is joined by another German immigrant named Frank Wally or Franz Valle and they uh, own the brewery and the first record we have of the brewery brewing beer uh, is in 1857 when they took out an advertisement in the local newspaper that said they are now brewing a top-rate quality of lager so, uh, though they probably did ales before that too. But that, that's the start of this whole brewery. So, um, where we are right now in the brewery, um, obviously we're underground. Um, we're, we're into the ground a little bit. The beer flows to this day. Yeah, we have several different brand lines. We have our Point Sprues. Starting back with Point Special was our flagship brew from 1857, but it has extended into the craft category with great options such as our Point Amber and our Drop Dead Blonde. We also make a whole hog craft beer line that is our Brewmaster specialty line of beers. A little bit higher alcohol and gravity to those beers, but we did just come out with a new Key Lime Pie Golden Ale that's pretty good. Quality beer starts with quality ingredients. We head back down to see how the process begins. So where we are now is the 1856-1857 foundations of the brewery. And unlike today where you have these malt shops from, you know, in Wisconsin or even all over the world if you need like specialty malts, you actually had to make malt in those days. So a farmer would farm 
and harvest barley, and then they would bring it to the brewery, and the brewery would turn it into malt. The malting process works like this, and this is what you would have seen down here in the 1850s and 60s, is you would have seen trays set out with uh, barley on it, and to turn it into malt, you German get it to germinate. And so you're gonna spray water on it until it's almost ready to sprout, to mature it, and then you're gonna roast it right away. And the longer you roast the malt, the darker the malt gets, and it gets that roasty chocolatey flavor. That also gives you the color of your beer. So that's where the color of your beer comes from, is how dark your malt is. But if you like like a really dark beer, and it tastes has that kind of like coffee, roasty, chocolate flavor, that's why. And a really light beer doesn't have that, because it's not been roasted as long. But that's what happened down here, is you would have seen huge trays of local barley being malted in the 1850s and 60s. So the way the brewing process works is after we had, had the malt, right, getting, getting uh, malted in the, in the basement, and then they would bring it up here, and the first step in the brewing process is putting it in the mash tun, um, which is right here, the mash kettle is what they call it here. And in the mash kettle, you're putting that grain with the water that you need to make beer happen. And it's gonna be mashed in there for about 60 minutes at about 152 degrees. And after it's in there, getting all of the enzymes at that point to extract from the grain. Um, you want those enzymes because later they're gonna convert into sugars and yeast likes sugar because that's how you get alcohol. And so that's where that starts is in that process and you're gonna move all of that liquid over to the louter ton which is in that back corner over there. And the louter ton is like basically like a giant sieve or strainer. And it's got these big arms that separate the liquid from the grain because you don't want the grain anymore, you just want that liquid. And they separate it because louter means to separate in German. The grain is still very protein rich, and so what happens is that uh, that grain goes to a farmer out near Custer, Wisconsin, not far from here. A bunch of farmers out there use it to feed their cattle. So if you're ever in Custer and you notice that the cows are especially happy cows, that's why they're, they, they get all the good point beer grains. After it's in the louder ton, you have that liquid, you're gonna pump it into this big thing behind me, which is the boil kettle. And um, in there, it's gonna be in there for about an hour, and you're getting those uh, enzymes to convert into sugars over that hour. That's also when you do your hop additions, if you're putting hops in during the brewing process. So a lot happens in this room, this is very important, but they just installed this brand new, beautiful brew house, made in Germany, keeping up the tradition of uh, German brewing here at this site. So it's pretty cool, we're really excited. All right, so where we are right now is in a lagering cellar. And lagers are different than ales. There's two different kinds of yeast strains, basically, for beer. Um, and ales are much hardier and can take higher temperatures for fermentation. Um, lagers are a little more finicky they need colder temperatures to finish fermenting and as well as they lager. So lager is a German word that means to store. And so after it's done fermenting, you actually put it into a colder temperature space. And what that does is the lager yeast will then filter the beer and settle on the bottom, uh, making a lager a really clear, crisp beer. So if you ever have a lager that's kind of cloudy, it's not a very good lager. You want it to, that to be a beer you can almost be transparent with. But that's what's happening is here is beer is just waiting to go on to the next phase. But this is all lagers in here. In the late 1800s, the brewery continued to grow. George Reuter doesn't stay with the brewery for that long. So he helps found the brewery, and in 1860, just three years after founding the brewery, he goes north up to Wausau and founds a brewery up there. That actually, an incarnation of that lasts all the way up until the 1950s. And Frank Wally stays on uh, as owner, and he's got some other partners. And uh, during the Civil War, he gets joined by a new apprentice named Jacob Lutz. Um, who he and his brother are, we think they're hops farmers down from near the Almond area, just south of here, about 15 miles. So he starts uh, learning the brewing business while his brother Andrew is off fighting in the Civil War. When Andrew comes back, he starts to get Andrew interested in the brewery. Andrew was the eldest and had more money. In 1867, the Lutz brothers buy the brewery from Frank Wally. And that starts this Im immense period of growth and uh, stability for the brewery because Andrew Lutz will own the brewery from 1867 all the way to 1897. In 1872, you have to remember this is 15 years after the founding of the brewery, 14 years after Stevens Point officially becomes a city. The city has grown quite a bit. There's, by that point, 
couple thousand residents. People need more beer. There's not a, there, there's a few other smaller, probably what we would consider like a brew pub, like a local tavern that might brew their own beer, but nothing on this scale. And so in 1872, Andrew Lutz uh, builds the room we're standing in right now, which is the brew house, and builds this big new brew house building to be able to bring more beer to the people of Stevens Point. So that's where we're in now. And so basically from 1872 up until last week, all beer was brewed in this, built, in this room. Um, where we are now is actually by one of the exterior walls of the original brewery. This building is kind of a Frankenstein. It's just been added on to and, and stuff over the years. The brewery was owned by Andrew Lutz until 1897. Uh, and then a guy named Gustav Kunzel buys the brewery and he owns it until 1901. And then a group of Stevens Point business owners get together and they actually incorporate the brewery for the first time as the Stevens Point Brewing Company. It actually becomes known as that for the first time. Um, it's referred to loosely as the Stevens Point Brewery before that, but it's actually that's the official name in 1901. By 1907, Point Brewery has their first major competition on the local scene, and that is that there are a bunch of Polish tavern keepers that didn't like that they were sending all their money to German brewers. So they opened their own brewery not far from here called the Polish Brewing Company. It was a very short-lived brewery. They changed their name in 1914 to the National Brewing Company. By 1916, they were out of business. They had survived a, a tornado ripping through their complex. And then in 1916, they had a batch of bad beer that actually put them out of business. Um, but in 1907, when this new state-of-the-art brewery was built just down the street, the people at Point Brewery were freaking out. And so uh, they built on to Andrew Lutz's 1872 brew house. And you can actually see behind me the brick from 1872, or the stonework from 1872. And if you look higher, you can see where in 1907 they added on and created this huge brewing, modern brewing complex that was the basic layout of the brewery all the way up until the 1980s. All right, so continuing on with the brewing process and how this once worked here. All they do today is to like cool things down, they will run things through very cold pipes. Back, you know, up until the 1980s, 1970s, after you have the beer in the boil kettle, you have to cool it down before you can put yeast in it. Otherwise, the yeast will die right away. You can't have boiling, boiling, <laughs> boiling beer and then have yeast in it. Um, and so how they would do that is different than they did it today. Today, a bunch of really cold pipes, pumps it into a chamber, you put the yeast in, you're done. It's all automated. Uh, how they used to do it is they would pump it up uh, actually to a, a container above this room here that is called a cool ship. And that's a technique that is still used in like parts of Belgium today to cool beer down. It's a very natural way to cool beer down. And what it is is it's a big wide open tray and it uses surface to air ratio to quickly cool down the beer. So you don't have this, this cooling system that you have to rely on to be able to do it. Um, before it gets pumped into where you're gonna pitch the yeast, it needs to be held somewhere. And so actually this room behind me is not a room. This was actually a cleaned room that is a beer tank. Like you could close the door and there would be beer in there. So pretty cool. So what happened in this room is this is another cellar where you would have the, the, the beer being where it was fermenting, but they actually started their beer with open fermentation, which is something that's not really done nowadays too because there's a fear that you could contaminate the beer uh, because it's open and things could get in, in it. Um, and before it has alcohol, it could get contaminated. So um, over in this area here, um, there actually was a large open fermenting container where they would pitch the yeast. Yeast loves air when it first starts getting going. And so that's where that would happen is right there. Point Brewery, like I mentioned, is a survivor. After Prohibition, there were 750 breweries left in the United States, which was down from before Prohibition by a lot. But still, 750 is not nothing. Nowadays, we have 8,000. Very different than today when there's breweries everywhere. But in 1933, it was still 750 breweries in America. 40 years later, there are only 65 breweries left. And it was looking like Point Brewery would probably be headed that way too. Other breweries in Wisconsin were going out of business left and right, which provided the opportunity for places still in business like Point to get equipment for cheap. So that's what happened in what you have in this room. Um, these fermenters are actually from People's Brewing Company in Oshkosh. 
I did my master's thesis on this brewery. It was the first black owned brewery in the state. The, the brewery's roots stretch back to, to the 19 teens, but in 1970, as this, all this consolidation is going on in, in the industry with breweries going out of business, this group of black Milwaukee businessmen bought this small brewery in Oshkosh and tried to make it work. Um, it went out of business in 1972 and that's when Point Brewery bought these tanks from them. So we have large artifacts of the first black owned brewery here in Stevens Point. Okay, so prohibition ends in 1933. The United States had been dry for 13 years with no legal beer being produced. Franklin Roosevelt comes into office and is inaugurated in March of 1933. And one of the first things he does is lift some of the restrictions on the prohibition laws so that beer brewers can brew beer again at 3.2% alcohol. So it's not full strength yet. They needed Congress to do more than that, but he used his executive power to do that. He comes into office and says, April 7th is the day that things will be legal. And brewers, to be able to, be able to make uh, near beer, which Point Brewery made near beer to get through prohibition, they also made soda, but they made uh, near beer, and one of which was Point Special, that was actually a, a non-alcoholic beer first. And to be able to make that non-alcoholic beer, you first have to make regular beer. And so breweries were ready for this. And so at midnight on April 7th, uh, prohibition is lifted. There's a line around the block at Point Brewery of people waiting in line to get their beer. First person in line is a dude from Custer, which we talked about where the grain goes for the cows. A uh, guy from Custer is the first guy to get the uh, first beer. He gets two bottles of beer. That's all he wanted. The second person was a guy who worked for the Congress Club Bar, which is still a bar here in Stevens Point. And they bought a keg. And at 12, 11 a.m., the first beer was tapped in Stevens Point after Prohibition. What happened at the brewery, though, was that in 1924, a guy named Ludwig Korfman bought the brewery, um, which in 1924, prohibition's going on, and that's a risky investment. He was a brewery supply salesman from Milwaukee, and he bet every year that at some point, prohibition had to end. Um, and so he took on a lot of risk, as did the brewmaster, who had moved here and started brewing in 1912. His name was George Egenhofer. He was a German immigrant who came here and suddenly found himself unable to brew beer, but stuck with the brewery. And so they were very excited uh, at midnight on April 7, 1933, and they came over to this elevator shaft, and this isn't hooked up anymore, but this rope blew a steam whistle that would signal shift change. And um, so they blew it. Yeah, it's not working. Dang it. Didn't tell them. But they, they blew this a lot that day on the hour to tell the people of Stevens Point that their brewery was again open and that you could get real beer once again. This is a fun stop on the tour here. This is not on the regular tour of the brewery, uh, but it's historic. Um, and that it has to do with these little circles on the wall right here. Uh, behind this wall is a lagering cellar. So it's cold in there. It's basically a big refrigerator. These holes are beer taps. So at one point there was beer taps for the employees. Um, point is still a union brewery and, and that happened in the 1930s. And actually management wanted them to unionize because as the story goes, the union truckers were messing with the non-union trucks. And so they said, just unionize and get this over with. And so they unionized and as part of their union uh, bargaining agreement, uh, they got beer breaks. And so if you talk to people who had been at the brewery for a long time, they'll be like, yep, got to work about nine o'clock, had a beer. Coffee break around 10.30, have a beer. Lunchtime at noon, have a beer. Truck drivers come back at three o'clock, come down here and you pour yourself another beer. This is also a kind of a community center for the brewery because that's cool back there and they would actually make their own sauerkraut for like parties and birthday parties and celebrations and things like that. So you have your beer and your sauerkraut and we are definitely in Wisconsin in this part of the brewery. Where we are right now is where the quality control labs are for Point Brewery. That's a new thing for breweries. A lot of times breweries would actually ship out their samples to a lab like Siebel Institute in Chicago. Um, but now all that's done in-house to make sure that products are consistent and great tasting and safe for consumers. So that's what's happening here now. What this room used to be was the kegging room. So you would see people kegging beer back here and beer kegging has changed a lot over the years. How they used to do it with both wooden kegs and then moving into steel and aluminum kegs was you actually had to line the beer with a resin called pitch, which was uh, flavorless, but it would seal the beer in without affecting the flavor from the barrel. Um, and there was a pitch house behind here where you would have to, to be able to get the old pitch out, you had to basically light it on fire 
get it to drain out and then reline it. It was a very dangerous practice. The only time that there was ever a fire though in this complex was in the mid 1980s because there's a chimney right over here and some birds had built a nest right on top of the chimney. Yeah, so in the early days of Point Brewery, uh, most things were just kegged and you'd have to go to a tavern or, uh, you know, uh, somewhere like the brewery you could just come by and, and that's, you know, how growlers really came about was a container you could take beer home in. Eventually Point Brewery had a bottling house. Um, but you had to bottle everything by hand. It would take forever. Uh, by 1914, uh, the brewery built this complex here, this building here that now has the gift shop in the front that was originally offices. And this was like the first modern bottling plant for the brewery. Canned beer started in 1935 uh, on the East Coast. Uh, there was a test brand uh, that was used called Kruger Beer. They were out of New Jersey. Um, and basically what they were trying to figure out is if you could make canned beer taste like draft beer because there's a real, or bottled beer, because there's a real fear that the, uh, the metal of the, the can would contaminate the flavor. So there's a whole, it was called keg-lined beer. Like it was this lining in each can to make sure that that flavor wouldn't seep in. Uh, Point Brewery was really slow to get on this because they didn't want to have to invest in new equipment. And so, uh, it wasn't until 1953 that the brewery starts uh, using cans. Let me just kind of get you caught up on ownership. So Ludwig Korfman buys the brewery in 1924. It's owned by the Korfman family up until basically uh, the mid-1980s when the Shabilsky family purchased it. In 1930, during the dark days of Prohibition, Phil Shabilsky comes on staff as an accountant for the brewery. He was doing more than accounting because there was um, only four employees at the brewery. They were making no money in Prohibition at this point. They were really having a hard time. Um, so Phil Shabilsky comes on, and then in 1970, Phil's son comes on board, whose name is Ken Shabilsky. And uh, in the mid-1980s, Ken buys the brewery, but by 1992, the brewery needed a lot of reinvestment that the Shabilskys just didn't have the resources to do. And so, uh, they sold the brewery to Barton Beers out of Chicago. Uh, Barton Beers was a much larger company who could do things like uh, install new equipment. They put a new brew house in. They, you know, they did also new aging tanks, things like that. They also were a big brewery band though that also had like Corona on their radar. Like they, that was part of their portfolio. So uh, for a time, Point and Corona were a part of the same beer company. Uh, but then by uh, the early 2000s, uh, two guys from Milwaukee, Jim Wickman and then Joe Martino, who's like the operating partner, uh, they brought, bought the brewery and have shepherded it into the craft beer era, expanding the pro product line, uh, hiring more people, and really solidifying Point Brewery's place in the uh, beverage world today. Point Brewery also makes Cider Boys hard ciders. That's made very differently than beer, whereas beer has this multi-step process. Ciders, you're essentially taking the fruit juices and you're fermenting them in the kettle with the liquid to dilute them to make it taste the way you want to taste it. Um, because the sugar that's in the fruit is all you need for the yeast to produce the, the alcohol. So it's a much less complicated part of the process. Cider Boys Hard Cider, that is our craft hard cider, basically alcoholic apple juice for adults. And we take fruitful pairings on that where we take our hard apple base and pair it with other great fruit flavors that balance it out. And soda, I should mention too. We've had soda for a little while now, since early 2000s. It's our non-alcoholic option for customers. Root beer is definitely the fan favorite out of that line. Sometimes the adults like it more than the kids, but it is definitely some of the kitty cocktails, the fan favorite for kiddos. Works really good when you're making root beer floats or different types of ice cream floats, like our orange cream is like a dreamsicle in a glass. You'll want to check out the unique merch in their gift shop. We have quite a mixture. We do have a lot of like apparel, so talking about your t-shirts, long sleeves, sweatshirts, once in a while we get like sweatpants or like pajama pants, depending on the season. But we have a lot of odds and ends stuff too. Like we get into lots of different glassware, lots of different hats options, beer stuff. So your can koozies, bottle koozies, beer bread, trinkets such as magnets and can openers, kind of all sorts of stuff. We get a lot of different requests and we see what we can do. They also have special events. We do. We're setting up right now for our block party. That's in May. It's an um, event where we have an open band stage and food trucks and people can kind of come and go and purchase drink tickets and enjoy some beers while they're out there. We also have our Pointtoberfest event in the fall. That's kind of our Oktoberfest themed event. 
And then in spring, we also have a back run that we do where it's a five mile run followed by a beer tent afterwards. We ask about their hours. Right now we have our summer hours going. So our gift shops open Monday through Friday, at nine to five, Saturday, 10 to five, and Sunday, 10 to four. Our outdoor beer garden that's open for summer is open Monday through Thursday, 11 to six, Friday and Saturday, 11 to eight, and then Sundays, 11 to four. We are open year round. We do have shorter hours during the winter time um, where we usually close for Sundays, um, but we do try to offer tours every day that we are open. If you find yourself in Stevens Point, stop by for a cold one. Let us point you to this next video. They have great drinks as well.